as I was talking to you all, number of you, and just kind of uh, in our introduction sessions and just getting to know a little bit about you and sharing a little bit about this training, I found a kind of theme arising in how I was talking about this, um, which is basically um, a kind of three circle overlapping Venn diagram, if you like, um, in which in one circle we have um, something like the Mahayana perspective here. I've got a little, here it is visualize. So the top circle there is the Mahayana. The next one is masculinity. And then the last one is maturity. If you can read my writing. And what I imagine that we're focusing on here is kind of the space that overlaps and connects between all these three spaces. This is really the heart of what we're focusing on uh, as I understand it. Um, so I want to say just a few words on each of these perspectives and hope that it'll help kind of clarify what that intersection point looks like uh, or where we might be exploring during our time together. Um, the Mahayana, uh, of course, is a Buddhist term that refers to the second, uh, I would call it the second iteration of Buddha Dharma. Um, in the tradition, it's called the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. Uh, it's a whole, it relates to a whole set of teachings that emerged around the first, second century CE. They're especially connected to a particular kind of mythical philosopher named Nagarjuna, monk philosopher. And Nagarjuna's teachings um, on emptiness, um, how I kind of understand the basic shift here from the early Buddhist tradition um, to the Mahayana tradition is not so much that the Mahayanas made up some completely new thing that wasn't it, at all present in early Buddhism. It's more that they brought forward something that was present and really emphasized it uh, and made it kind of central uh, and, and sort of distinguished uh, a, a kind of different approach to practice that uh, is still present in the early Buddhist tradition because the historical Buddhas was also known to be a Bodhisattva when his all of his past lives are described in these, what are called the Jataka tales. He's described as the Bodhisattva, this being who's kind of working on perfecting his awakening um, over many lifetimes. This is the basic great right, Buddhist uh, mythology. And um, so the idea of the Bodhisattva is present even from early on, but there's kind of a shift and an emphasis um, in this tradition in terms of how I think emptiness, uh, the the goal of practice in some ways is described and it's not that the term emptiness isn't used in the first turning either, but it takes on a more significant meaning in the second turning in the first turning. Really, there is much more of an emphasis on noticing what are called the three characteristics uh, of existence or experience. Um, the three marks, Anicca, impermanence, uh, anatta, no self, and dukkha, suffering. Um, and the kind of point of practice in a way is to notice these things, especially insight practice, to notice the, that these characteristics are always present in experience and, and noticing that actually leads to a kind of freedom or liberation. Um, in the Mahayana tradition, this idea of selflessness is in a lot of ways reconceptualized. Um, so the idea in, instead of saying, okay, well, be, just because you look for your own experience, you look for, in your experience and you see, is there a self? Well, no, I just see flickering images, self images, sensations. Um, and I can't actually find any central reference point to which any of this refers there must not be a central reference point. I'm making this up. It's a, it's a mental fabrication, right? This is kind of in a lot of ways how I understood selflessness in my early practice uh, days of doing Vipassana. It's like, I can't find a reference point in my experience. Thus, there isn't a solid or stable one. Uh, the, to which the Mahayana tradition says, yes, and it's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that there isn't a self. It's that the self is actually interdependently arising. It's arising with everything else, with everyone else. Um, and so it's kind of a little too nihilistic uh, to say that there is no self. The self is a temporary 
phenomena uh, that co arises with every other thing. And in that sense, it's not about self negation uh, or negating the reality of others, but rather it's about recognizing that self is an independent. It's not independent of anything else. Um, and so in a way, there's a kind of shift. Uh, the American Vipassana teacher Shinzen Young, he talks about how in the Mahayana tradition, wisdom and compassion become equally important. Whereas in the earlier tradition, maybe wisdom was held a little higher than the qualities of love and kindness and care. Like these are considered relative practices. The Brahma Viharas, the absolute wisdom is found only through insight. Um, and so there's a little bit of a kind of hierarchy there, wisdom over the heart, even though the heart is emphasized in the early tradition. Uh, and here it's like, well, if you don't understand, if you understand emptiness in terms of interdependence primarily, then suddenly compassion becomes central. Uh, I remember I was on retreat with uh, Joseph Goldstein, some long retreat at IMS, probably the three month retreat. And he said, um, someone asked him what compassion was. And he said, you know, uh, compassion is the, um, movement of emptiness it's the movement of emptiness and i liked that and i think there's something there when we understand our sense of identity as being co-emergent as in it's emerging with everything else and everyone else then we're connected to everything and everyone else and thus um compassion is just it makes just as much sense uh the natural outflowing of that realization to help ease the suffering of other beings, as does the attempt to ease our own suffering or to see through our suffering. Um, and of course, the ideal in the Mahayana tradition, instead of the arhat, which is the ideal of the early Buddhist tradition, the fully enlightened one, and my teacher, Daniel Ingram, says he's the arhat, <laughs> Daniel Ingram. Uh, instead here, uh, the bodhisattva claims a different kind of ideal or identity which is as the bodhisattva, the one who's aspiring to awaken uh, on behalf of all beings and to help all beings awaken. And I think here, it's just very simple to me. It's like, oh, well, this just basically means that we don't see our awakening as being separate from other people's awakening. Um, just imagine I can get very awake and then I'm going to run into like what, like systemic, like suffering, dukkha. You know, I'm going to run into like all the unawakened things that are embedded in our culture and society and systems and laws. And then what, you know, I'm just going to hang out being awake. Uh, no, actually it's not, it doesn't work that way. You can only be so as awake as, as your environment and the other people around you allow for, um, because we're not in independent of each other. So our awakening is actually tied together. And um, that's the basic idea here in the Mahayana tradition. Um, and then the other part of the Mahayana I want to highlight is like form is emptiness and emptiness is form to say in the heart sutra, um, this idea that there isn't a duality either between Nirvana and samsara. These are actually two sides of the same unfolding reality. Uh, there's the emptiness or the awareness side, and then there's the form or experience side. And at a, in the deep meditative realization, we start to actually understand that these things are co-arising as well. Um, and for me, what that means is that the world of form of our experience of each other becomes equally the ground of practice. It's not that we're trying to transcend uh, that experience. We're actually trying to be more skillful in how we relate to it um, because we don't think that it's in meaningless or insignificant. It's actually is equally important to, um, to like jhanas or emptiness or whatever the heck it is we do in our meditation. Um, so yeah, a little on the Mahayana in, in terms of the masculinity side of this now. So we've got the Bodhisattva ideal form is emptiness, emptiness form, compassion is just as important as wisdom. And it's all, it's all valid. It's all there's emptiness and there's fullness of life. Um, well then part of that fullness, part of the specific way in which reality manifests interdependently is that some people are born into male bodies. Some people have male or masculine identities, and we have a particular culture uh, in which we learn about what these things mean and are enculturated into. Uh, and then we have certain systems and laws and kind of norms in society that reinforce those things. Um, 
And I'm mentioning each of those ind independently of each other because I don't think they're all the same. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate or right to say that because you're born into a male body, you are a man or that you identify as a man. Um, obviously, there is, uh, there's not a direct connection or correlation between our bodies and our identities. And that's, I think, become pretty clear, um, especially, you know, in the 21st century, this, this ought to be clear to everyone who has family members who don't fit into that, uh, that simple, um, that simple one-to-one -one connection. Um, and yet there's a correlation. Uh, I think it's also maybe an extreme point of view to say, well, we just are totally making it up. Uh, or it's totally socially constructed. Well, there tends to be more male identity when, with male bodies, <laughs> you know, and there, and there are certain things that are associated with being in a male body that are biologically, you know, uh, verifiable, like hormones, you know, and certain levels of hormones, et cetera. Um, and, you know, not saying, you know, biology is destiny, but not also not saying biology is made up, you know. Here we've got, I'm proposing here with the masculinity that we're in this training, we're, we're holding this view that um, it's not completely uh, biologically determined and nor is it culturally constructed. It's something, it's something in between, you know, it's, it's in some place where you don't completely uh, where there's nature and nurture, and there's all these factors that are kind of co-constructing our experience of masculinity. And then there's our culture, you know, not all of us come from the same culture. Some of us, uh, I know, uh, grew up in Southern United States where we had a particular view, what masculinity is probably that's sort of similar to each other, but then even within your family of origin, it might be different. My family, I came up in the South, but my family was from, um, from the Northern United States and my grandfather who I grew up with, it was Palestinian. And I had a lot of Arabic family members who were around and there's different ideas and different cultures, you know, about these things and what they mean, different expectations, um, about how we're going to show up in these roles, different languages, you know, with different emphasis, you know, if you've noticed the English language doesn't encode words with male and female, but some romance languages do those. There's actually a feminine and masculine encode encoding in the language itself. Um, so we have that too, you know, our cultural conditioning uh, that determines how we understand what it is to be a man or to be masculine. Uh, and all of these things are things I want to just throw open or like are on the table to explore as part of this training. Um, I'm assuming where everyone here is identifying with the masculine because that was kind of the invitation. If you feel a sense of identity with what it, whatever that means to be a man, and I think we'll explore that. Um, that's part of the training as well. And then the last part is maturity. So we've got the Mahayana masculinity and maturity. And here, uh, for me, I'm, I'm really informed by Ken Wilber's integral philosophy because he was one of my first mentors and someone I learned a lot from at a very uh, formative time in my intellectual and spiritual development. Uh, and, and he explicitly brings in various traditions, um, especially in the uh, developmental psychology, uh, as well as developmental maps and stuff in the spiritual traditions, uh, in which we acknowledge or can acknowledge this frame that um, that some things develop or mature over time in a fairly predictable patterns. And here I'll just use a very, very simple model, which is, you know, immature and mature, <laughs> you know, let's, let's just make it two levels, you know, uh, like the very least we're talking about what it means to be mature and we're wanting to, um, explore maturity, um, I use this quote. I don't know if you you all remember the quote that was in the front of the the Bodhisattva uh, Bodhisattva training webpage from Uchiyama Roshi, in which he says a Bodhisattva is an ordinary person who acts like a true adult. So um, this is a very I think interesting way of talking about maturity. Being a true adult, what does that mean? You know, to be mature. Well, like for me, it means I'm able to hold lots of commitments together. Like I have different commitments that I've made and I'm accountable for those commitments. You know, like I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to unload the dishes and take out the trash. Uh, and I'm going to do that consistently 
and regularly. It's not going to like one day, you know, I'm not going to wake up and there's just like, we're out of dishes and it's like overflowing and no, no one can eat anymore in the house. Um, you know, like there's trash everywhere, like basic commitments like that, but also work commitments. I'm going to show up on time for the most part and be present. Um, I'm going to let people know, communicate when I'm not able to be, um, I'm going to treat people with decency and respect again, for the most part, I'm aiming to do that as much as I can. Obviously there are moments where I have lapses and part of being a true adult is acknowledge, acknowledging when that happens. Like, okay, yeah, I fucked up. Sorry about that. Like, um, I'm going to try to do better. Um, and then for me, maturity also looks like taking in and holding multiple perspectives you know, being able to, to honor and acknowledge my perspective, while also getting that my perspective isn't the final truth about reality, that other people aren't just like failed versions of me, um, but actually they're holding a different perspective. They have a different life experience. They've been through and seen different things. They come from different places. And so they are holding um, truths about reality that, uh, that I may not completely understand. I may, I may want to, and I may be able to understand more, but I, uh, I, I sort of can acknowledge, oh, there's at very least there's my perspective and then there's everyone else's. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, maturity to me is about all of these things and more. And I, I hope we'll explore what that means actually here to be, um, to be mature, to grow up, to be a true adult.